Eisenhorn by Dan Abnett Zenos Malleus Hereticus Reading from Chapter 1 A Cold Coming Death in the Dormant Vaults Some Puritanical Reflections Hunting the Recidivist Murden Iclone, I came to Hubris in the dormant of 240.m41, as the imperial sidereal calendar has it. Dormant lasted 11 months of Hubris's 29-month lunar calendar, and the only signs of life were the custodians with their lighted poles and heat gowns, patrolling the precincts of the hibernation tombs. Within those sulking basalt and ceramite vaults, the grandees of hubris slept, dreaming in crypts of aching ice, awaiting fall. The middle season between dormant and vital even the air was frigid. Frost encrusted the tombs, and a thick cake of ice covered the featureless land. Above, star patterns twinkled in the curious, permanent night. One of them was Hubris's son, so far away now. Come thaw, Hubris would spin into the warm embrace of its star again. Then it would become a blazing grope. Now it was just a fuzz of light. As my gun cutter sat down on the landing cross tomb point, I had pulled on an internally heated body skin and swatches of sturdy, insulated foul weather gear. But still, the perilous cold cut through me now. My eyes watered, and the tears froze on my lashy cheeks. I remember the details of the cultural brief my savant had prepared, and quickly lowered my frost visor. Trembling, as warm air began to circulate under my plastique mask. Custodians alerted to my arrival by astropathic hails stood waiting for me at the base of the landing cross, their lighted poles dipped in obeisance in the frozen night, and the air streamed with the heat that bled from their cloaks. I nodded to them showing their leader my badge of office. An ice car awaited an rust-colored arrowhead 20 meters long, mounted on ski blade runners and spiked tracks. It carried me away from the landing cross as I left the winking signal lights and the serrated dagger shape of my gun cutter behind in the perpetual winter night. The spiked tracks kicked up blizzards of rheem behind us. Ahead, despite the lamps, the landscape was black and impenetrable. I rode with Laura's ribbon and three custodians in the cabin, lit only by the amber glow of the craft's control panel. Heating vents recessed in the leather seats breathed out warm, stale air. A custodian handed a blank data slate to Vibben. She looked at it curiously and paused it on to me. I realized my frost visor was still down. I raised it and began to search my pockets for my eyeglasses. With a smile... Vibben produced them from within her own swaddled, insulated garb. I nodded thanks, put them on my nose, and began to read. I 
was just calling up the last points of text when the ice car halted. Processional 12, announced one of the custodians. We dismounted, sliding our visors down into place. Jewels of frost flakes fluttered in the blackness above us, sparkling as they crossed through the ice car's lamp beams. I've heard of bitter cold. Emperor's grace me, I never feel it again. Biting, crippling, actually bitter to taste on the tongue. Every joint in my frame protested and creaked. My hands and my mind were numb. That was not good. Processional 212 was a hibernation tomb at the west of the Imperial Avenue. It housed 12,142 members of the hubris ruling elite. We approached the great monument, crunching up the black frost-coated steps. I halted. Where are the tomb's custodians? Making their rounds, I was told. I glanced at Vivin and shook my head. She slid her hand into her furrowed, edged robes. Knowing we approach... I urged, addressing the custodian again, knowing we expect to meet them. I will check, said the custodian, the one who had circulated the slate. He pushed on up the steps, the phosphor light on his pole bobbing. The other two seemed ill at ease. I beckoned to Vibin so she would follow me up after the leader. We found him on a lower terrace, gazing at the strewn bodies of four custodians, their light poles fizzing out and around them. How, he stammered. Stay back, Vivin told him as she drew her weapon, its tiny amber-armed ring glowing in the darkness. I took out my blade, igniting it. It hummed. The south entry of the tomb was open. Shafts of golden light shone out. All of my fears were rapidly being confirmed. We entered, Vivin sweeping the place from side to side with her hammer gun. The hall was narrow and high, lit by chemical glow globes. Introducing frost was beginning to mark the polished basalt walls. A few meters inside, another custodian lay dead in a stifling mirror of blood. We swept over him. To each side, hallways opened up, admitting us to the hibernation stacks. In every direction, rows and rows of icebergs rained down the smooth basalt chambers. It was like walking into the Imperium's grandest morgue. Vivin swept soundlessly to the right, and I went left. I admit I was excited by now eager to close and conclude a business that had lasted six years. I clay had evaded me for six whole years. I studied his methods every day and dreamed of him every night. Now, I could smell him. I raised my visor, water pattering from the roof. Thaw water. It was growing warmer in here. In their ice berths, some dim figures were stirring. Too early. Far too early. 
and Kone's first man came at me from the west as I crossed a trunk junction corridor. I spun. The power sword in my hand, I cut through his neck before his ice axe could land. The second came from the south, the third from the east, and then more, more. A blur. As I fought, I heard furious shooting from the vault away to my right. Vibin was in trouble. I could hear her over the vox link in our hoods. Eisenhorn! Eisenhorn! I reeled and cut. My opponents were all dressed in heat gowns and carried ice tools that made proficient weapons. Their eyes were dark and unforthcoming. Though they were fast, there was something in them that suggested they were doing this mindlessly. By order. The power sword, an antique and graceful weapon, blessed by the provost of Inks himself, spun in my hand. With five abrupt moves, I made corpses out of them and left their blood vapor drifting in the air. Eyes and horn. I turned and ran. I splashed heavily down a corridor, sluiced with melt water. More shots from ahead. A sucking cry. I found Vibin. Face down across a freezer tube. Frozen blood gluing her to the sub-zero plastic. Eight of Iconi's servants lay sprawled around her. Her weapon lay just out of reach of her clawing hand. The spent cell ejected from the grip. I am 42 standard years old in my prime by imperial standards, young by those of the Inquisition. All my life I have had a reputation for being cold, unfeeling. Some have called me heartless, ruthless, even cruel. I am not. I am not beyond emotional response or compassion, but I possess, and my masters count this as perhaps my paramount virtue, a singular force of will. Throughout my career, it has served me well to draw on this facility and steel myself, unflinching at all this wretched galaxy can throw at me. To feel pain or fear or grief is to allow myself a luxury I cannot afford. Loris Vibben had served with me for five and a half years. In that period, she had saved my life twice. She saw herself as my aide and my bodyguard. Yet in truth, she was more a companion and a fellow warrior. When I recruited her from the clan sand slums of Tornish, it was for her combat skills and brutal vigor. But I came to value her just as much for her sharp mind, soft wit, and clear head. I stared down at her body for a moment. I believe I may have uttered her name. So, that's Eisenhorn, an introduction. Anyway, we're going to finish chapter one in just a moment. I love this omnibus. Um, it has all three of the initial Eisenhorn books in it, Xenos, Malleus, and Hereticus in it, which if you don't know, those are the orders of the Inquisition. Uh, within the Imperium of Mankind, and um, Eisenhorn is one of the Inquisitors. They are basically the ultimate force of law for the God Emperor. So before we continue into the rest of Chapter 1, let's talk about it. This is actually the first of any Warhammer material 
I ever read. Um, I believe I was 17 or 18 ish. I was a teenager, an older teenager, uh, when someone introduced me to the Warhammer universe. I've always been a sci fi fan, but I didn't know anything about Warhammer at the time. And I was like, what's a Warhammer? And I didn't understand that it was a whole universe and many authors, the tabletop game, didn't know anything about that. But I was a reader. I love to read. And this was handed to me. And after the first chapter, I recall I read this entire omnibus in like two weekends. It captured my attention. And this is the book that started my love affair with Warhammer. So let's talk a little bit about this thing called the Inquisition. So in this era of the Warhammer universe, the Emperor is good and entombed on the golden throne of Terra. So this is like in between the Horus Heresy and what's happening in the Warhammer universe right now with Primarchs coming back, rumors of the Emperor being resurrected, blah, 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 blah. We're smack dab in the middle with the stories of Eisenhorn and a couple of other really good um, Inquisitor books out there like Ravenor. That's a good series to read, the Ravenor series. If you, if you like this, you'll probably in, enjoy that as well. And there's, there's a few others that don't come to mind right now. Um, but the Inquisitors have an interesting position. Remember, as we've gone through the Horus Heresy, the Emperor himself has been very upfront that he never wanted religion for the Imperium of Mankind. He is, as far as we know, the longest lived human, and I use that term loosely. He's the longest lived human or humanoid uh, that is known. He has seen so much of human history and what religion has wrought that he wanted the Imperium that he set up through the galaxy for humans to be focused on those things that progress society forward. He wanted to be focused on science, on discovery, art, literature, history, but not religion. He wanted nothing of worship in his Imperium. And there's a couple of legions that get cast out by the Emperor because they dare to worship the Emperor as a god. Uh, and when the emperor rejected their worship, well, they decided to worship chaos because they wanted to worship something. <laughs> so they couldn't worship what they wanted. They, they found something to worship. Uh, and that's a whole other discussion for other books another day. Um, but once Horus's plan succeeds, he attacks Terra and is finally able to slay the emperor, which he really doesn't kill him. He kills his physical body and it puts the emperor basically into like this desiccated state where his mind and his psychic abilities are still very much alive and active. And as long as there are psychers, like thousands of them every day, being sacrificed and giving their psychic energy literally over to the emperor, um, his psyche and mind can be kept alive. Uh, and that's what Horus ends up doing. Horus thought he was going to kill, kill the emperor. And that, that didn't know what happened. He unwittingly united the entire galaxy around this symbol of the emperor. Because once the emperor is entombed on the golden throne, what the golden throne is, is, um, is a mechanical slash psychic media uh, by which uh, everyone can travel through the astronomicon, through the warp safely with the guiding light of the emperor's psychic beacon. Um, but, you know, thousands of souls daily have to be sacrificed to keep it going. You know, one thing about the Imperium of Man, everybody can die in service of the emperor, but, but hashtag equality. But anyway, the emperor himself had never had any inclinations toward religion. But once Horus killed him, he put the emperor in like martyr for humanity status. And he was the most powerful being, wisest, cleverest of all. And um, he was still the way people navigated through the warp. So he ended up elevating the emperor to godhood. That wasn't Horus's plan. And that's what the Eldar, if, if we're looking back into Legion and other stories um, that start pulling in the Cabal and the Eldar and everything else, that's what they're really trying to prevent is humanity 
uniting around the emperor as a religious symbol because religion has the power to persuade, convince, ensnare, entrap, whatever you want to say, unlike anything else that humans have at their disposal. And the Eldar, the Cabal, they knew that if that happened and Horus actually managed to kill the Emperor and humans united around the Golden Throne of Terra, that would actually unite humanity in a way that would be bad for the rest of the universe. And in comes Malkador the Sigilite. He is the right hand of the Emperor. He is his number one regent. If there is no Emperor, Malkador is in charge. And he sets up the roots of the Inquisition. Um, a little bit before the end of the Horus Heresy series, um, in Flight of the Eisenstein, when the members of that ship finally make it to Terra to warn the Emperor, Malkador, and the rest of the galaxy what's coming and what Horus has done, Malkador intercepts them, believes them, and actually sets up the seeds of what would become the Inquisition, which is the 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 right hand of the law <laughs> in all of the known galaxy. The Inquisition is scary because they are enforcers of religion and law basically without peer. To become an Inquisitor, the only greater thing a human might be able to become is an Astartes themselves. So Inquisitors like Astartes are recruited at a very young age because they might have certain abilities. Uh, they come from families that are very loyal to the Emperor and demonstrate that. They have intelligence, psychic abilities, whatever it might be. And they are given over to convents. They are given over to monasteries but because all things being equal, Inquisitors are not just male. It can be any, oh, everyone can die <laughs> for the Emperor. Um, but they are raised to be loyal to the Emperor without any question of their loyalty. And as they are raised and they study combat, they study the religion, the Leptidio Divinitatus, which is, you know, the religious book of the Imperium of Mankind and the worship of the God Emperor, you know, as they are raised in this and their abilities are grown, they change who they are, much like Astartes. Uh, they don't have to undergo a lot of gene-changing implants or anything else. Any that do, that's, that's honestly by choice and convenience of what's going to make them a better Inquisitor. But once they make it through the process of becoming an Inquisitor, they receive what's called an Imperial Rosette. And you can see that here on Eisenhorn's shoulder plate. This is his rosette. And that signifies to anyone in the Imperium of Mankind, this is an Inquisitor. If he asks you a question, answer. If he wants to go somewhere, you're going to let him in. They basically have carte blanche to carry out their duties. And in Eisenhorn, we are dropped into the middle of the Inquisitor Eisenhorn carrying out those duties, hunting down a traitor to the Imperial throne who is okay with mass murder <laughs> in order to achieve his goals. The Inquisitors are broken up into three different groups, and that is actually the title of the three books of the Omnibus, Xenos, Malleus, and Hereticus. So Xenos would be the alien, which that is uh, what Eisenhorn is a member of. He is an, a Xenos Inquisitor. His primary job is hunting down the alien doesn't mean he can't hunt down other stuff at all. I mean, it's kind of a free-for-all <laughs> with the Inquisition. But primarily, his order is concerned with hunting down alien species um, or humans that have gone alien, basically. They're not human enough anymore, and they present a threat to the Imperium of Mankind. And then the on the opposite end is Hereticus, and that's how the book ends. That's the heretic those who go against the golden throne of Terra. So we've got the alien, we've got the heretic on the other end. Well, what, what about that Malleus? These are the ones who are just out committing old crimes. <laughs> so 
Um, you know, they're, they're just committing regular, degular crimes on a grand scale, of course. Um, but the ones that I think have the most interesting stories are Xenos and Hereticus, uh, because this is the story of one Inquisitor um, and his journey as an Inquisitor. It is told from the first person, um, which is why I haven't done a voice change, because, I mean, if somebody's telling their own story, unless they're a natural storyteller, why would they change voice? Um, they're just telling you things as it happened. Um, but Eisenhorn, at the beginning of this book, is a young man. 42 in Imperial years is, is nothing. Um, these people live to be a thousand sometimes. <laughs> um, but at the end of the book, uh, at the beginning of the book, he is um, an Inquisitor in the highest regard. By the third book, Hereticus, he's being chased by the Inquisition. And that's the thing. The Inquisition doesn't have anyone above them as far as law is concerned. If an Inquisitor is labeled heretic, only the Inquisition will punish them. The Inquisition will come for you. That's like having the acronyms in America come, come for you. You know, like the FBI, the CIA, the acronyms. Um, and you don't want the Inquisition after you. Eisenhorn is, at the beginning of this omnibus, tracking down a particular criminal. And he has spent years doing so. doesn't mean he hadn't taken cases in the middle of that. Because uh, six years is a long time, tracking down one dude. Um, but the way he's able to do that and make progress is because of what this Imperial Rosette allows. If someone makes it to inquis Inquisitor status, they're as loyal as it gets to the Emperor. There is no one more loyal, and that's why they are given so much authority. And then that gives them the ability to access funds, resources, to recruit people, get ships, whatever they need. These Inquisitors can get whatever they need in resources from the Imperium, and that includes humans, that includes people, uh, that includes a place to store all their stuff, it, whatever they need, they can get it. So it's a big deal to be an Inquisitor. There are a lot of them, but not a lot compared to the amount of humans that are in the galaxy. So Inquisitors don't go after every single crime. Like there are planets where they know that the humans might not be super loyal to the Emperor, but they could call down and start a strike team to wipe the planet. Like, they're not going to get involved in that. They're chasing after those Xenos, those heretics, those who wish ill against the Imperium of Man, who could have effect that would ripple throughout the known galaxy and the what they call the, you know, the Imperium of Mankind. So it's a really interesting read. Now, I'm going to be honest, it is a little bit of a hard read. There are the words, <laughs> but there are a few chapters in here where Eisenhorn is um, trapped in different versions of, you know, altered reality. And it gets a little hard to follow because Dan Abnett does such a good job describing some things that like you're trying to picture what he's describing while you're reading. And it's like, ah, you're describing it a little too well. Um, so I'm not going to call this an easy read. It is not. But it is captivating, and I think that's why I was able to read it um, when I was younger so quickly. But it stayed with me, and I think I've read this entire omnibus three times. Yeah, <laughs> um, and that's over some years. That's not you know three times in a month or something. This you know, like every like four or five years, I will pick this this back up and get into it. Um, right now it's loaned out, <laughs> so I am. I happen to be in its presence <laughs> this weekend, so I thought I'd take an, uh, an opportunity to introduce Eisenhorn into our reading series here on the channel. So I know that was a little rambly, but to be quite honest, the Inquisition is rambly. It is so much. It has a singular focus altogether, but they do so much, and when you encounter other inquisitors and compare them to the first inquisitor this is the first inquisitor i knew of um in in the warhammer universe and you compare them and their methods like there are some inquisitors who never take their rosette off they don't have to they're inquisitors um and they're very bold about all of their actions that they do and there are other inquisitors who may not always display their rosette so they can do things you know a little alfarius omegani style <laughs> You know, do things under under the table, as they say in John Wick. Are you above the table or under the table? Anyhow, I digress. Another nerd universe. But um, let's finish out chapter one. And if it gets a good, you know, response, then I'll do some more out of this. This is a huge old book. I would never read the whole thing online. 
but there's some really cool battles in here. Like there's a, a chapter in here where Eisenhorn uses a demon he befriends. No wonder he got labeled heretic. But he uses a demon he gets control of to take down a titan. That's that's a really cool, like like it like the big line is Chernobyl take that thing down. I'll never forget it. Like I could see the whole thing when I was reading it. And Chernobyl like shoots out of the end of the staff or whatever, and this this demon envelops this this chaos titan that's attacking a city, and on its own it brings it down. But that's how everybody finds out finds out that Eisenhorn's like holding on to a demon in his pocket, basically like it's a whole thing. <laughs> anyway, I digress. So if y'all like this one. I'll read more of it, but let's go ahead and finish out chapter one. I extinguished my power sword and sliding it into its scabbard, moved back into the shadows on the far side of the hibernation gallery. I could hear nothing except the increasingly persistent thaw drip freeing my sidearm from its leather rib under my left armpit. I checked its load and opened a vox link. My clone was undoubtedly monitoring all traffic in and out of processional 212. So I used glossia, an informal verbal cipher known only to myself and my immediate colleagues. My Inquisitors develop their own private languages for confidential communication, some more sophisticated than others. Glossia, the basics of which I had designed ten years before, was reasonably complex and had evolved organically with each use. Thorn wishes Aegis rapturous beast below ages rising the colors of space betancourt responded immediately and correctly rose thorn abundant by flame light crescent a pause by flame light crescent confirm confirm razor dolphus pathway Pattern ivory. Pattern denied. Pattern cubicle. Aegis rising. The link broke. He was on his way. He had taken the news of Vidin's death as hard as I expected. I trusted that would not affect his performance. Midas Betancourt was a hot-blooded, impetuous man which was partly why I liked him, amused him. I moved out of the shadows again, my sidearm raised, a Scipio pattern naval pistol, finished in dull chrome with inlaid ivory grips. It felt reassuringly heavy in my gloved hand. Ten rounds, every one fat, blunt man-stopper were spring-loaded into the slide inside grip. I had four more armed slides just like it in my hip pocket. I forgot where I acquired this Scipio. It had been mine for a few years. One night, three years before, Vibin had prized off the ceramite grip plates with their touch-worn machine-stamped engravings of the Imperial Aquila and the navy motto, and replaced them with ivory grips she had etched herself. A common practice on Tornish, she informed me, handing the weapon back the next day. The rude grips were like crude scrimshaw, showing on each side a poorly executed human skull through which a thorny rose entwined, emerging through an eye socket shedding cartoon droplets of blood. She'd inlaid carmine gems into the droplets to emphasize their nature. Below the skull, my name was scratched in a clumsy scroll. I had laughed. 
There had been times when I'd almost been too embarrassed to draw the gang-marked weapon in a fight. Now, now she was dead, I realized what an honor had been paid to me through that devoted work. I made a promise to myself. I would kill Ikoni with this gun. As a devoted member of His High Majesty the God Emperor's Inquisition, I find my philosophy bends toward that of Amalethanes to the outside galaxy. Members of our order appear much alike. An inquisitor is an inquisitor, a being of fear and persecution. It surprises many that internally we are riven with clashing ideologies. I know it surprised Riven. I spent one long afternoon trying to explain the differences. I failed. To express it in simple terms, some Inquisitors are Puritans, and some are Radicals. Puritans believe in and enforce the traditional station of the Inquisition working to purge our galactic community of any criminal or malevolent element. The triumvirate of evil, alien, mutant, demon. Anything that clashes with the pure rule of mankind, the preaching of the ministerum, and the letter of imperial law is subjected to Puritan Inquisition's attention. Hardline, Traditional, merciless, that is the Puritan way. Radicals believe that any methods are allowable if they accomplish the inquisitorial task. Some, as I understand it, actually embrace and use forbidden resources, such as the warp itself, as weapons against the enemy of mankind. I have heard the arguments often enough. They appall me. Radical belief is heretical. I am a Puritan by calling, an Amalethian by choice. The ferociously strict ways of the monodominant philosophy oftentimes entices me. But there is precious little subtlety in their ways, and thus it is not for me. Amalathians take our name from the conclave at Mount Amaroth. Our endeavor is to maintain the status quo of the Imperium. We work to identify and destroy persons and agencies. that might destabilize the power of the Imperium from within or without. We believe in strength through unity. Change is the greatest enemy. We believe the God Emperor has a divine plan, and we work to sustain the Imperium in stability until that plan is made known. We deplore factions and infighting. Indeed, it is sometimes a painful irony that our beliefs mark us as a faction within the political helix of the Inquisition. We are the steadfast spine of the Imperium, its antibodies fighting disease, insanity, injury, evasion. I can think of no better way to serve, no better way to be an Inquisitor. So, you have me then pictured. Grigor Eisenhorn, Inquisitor, Puritan, Amalathian, 42 years old standard, an Inquisitor for the past 18 years. I am tall and broad-shouldered, strong, resolute. I have already told you of my force of will, and you will have noted my prowess with a blade. 
What else is there? Am I clean shaven? Yes. My eyes are dark, my hair darker and thick. These things matter little. Come, and let me show you how I killed a Koi. That's how you open a book. <laughs> and I misspoke earlier. Malleus is the mutant. I don't know why I left my that left my brain for a second. Somebody's going to come for me in the comments. It's fine. It's YouTube. I'm not going back and editing it because, no. <laughs> but, yeah, so the alien, the Xenos, the Malleus, the, the mutant, and Hereticus, the heretic. Those are the three main groups of enemies in post-Horus heresy, Imperium of Man. And Eisenhorn, at the beginning of his career, is a Puritan, as he says. Um, he doesn't believe in using tactics that basically the emperor himself would disapprove of. Um, remember, the emperor chastised Lorgar for daring to, one, worship him, and also tap into warp abilities that were forbidden. Um, even though Lorgar thought he was using them to help the Imperium. And there are other factions, um, the, the Little Brotherhood's lodges that are like in Horus's Legion, and then a couple of others, we find out that there are Astartes making use of warp magic um, and other things that are supposed to be forbidden uh, to be to be being used by uh, anyone in the Imperium. So it's it's really complex. I think the reason this book got me so much is because of that opening, I understood what was happening without having any prior knowledge of what this whole Warhammer thing was. And if you're looking for a place to start, one of these side books with um, one of the main characters who gets their own series or omnibus, this is a good place to start. There are some other Eisenhorn novels out there, and I've not read all of them. Um, because there's a lot of books. <laughs> there's a lot of books in Warhammer. Um, but if you get the opportunity or find this, I'm not sure that this version of the omnibus is still sold. This is an old one. This one... I think this one did, when did this one come out? I was looking to see when this particular one was printed. This omnibus was printed back in 2002. Xenos and Malleus were copyrighted in 2001, Hereticus in 2002. This omnibus came out in 2002. So this is a 21 year old book uh, at this point. Wow, oh. Oh, I just told you how old I am. Girl's 40, elder millennial, whatever. Um, but, yeah, and it was a good 40, ain't it? <laughs> uh, but I've really treasured this because it was such a good introduction into this thing called Warhammer. Because Warhammer is huge, you know, but all of these nerd universes are. You know, if you're into Lord of the Rings, Star Wars, Star Trek, Magic the Gathering, any of these universes are ma massive. You know, I'm also a big anime person. I know everything about Sailor Moon. I know everything about the Transformers. You know, I, I know everything about Fruits Basket. Whatever interests you, when you find that hook that gets you in, go all in. It's super fun. Um, and the more I dig into, you know, Warhammer, the more I love it. Uh, are there portions of the lore and literature that I'm more into than others? Of course there are. I really love the Horus Heresy, which is why I live there. Uh, but there are some bits outside of the Horus Heresy that, you know, I'm, I'm into as well. You know, and that's okay. You don't have to like all of something, uh, but you don't have to tear other people down because they like something different than you do. Don't ruin this for us. You know who you are. Um, <laughs> but I hope you enjoyed that. Uh, Y'all know about the contest. I'm not going to repeat the whole thing now. Uh, but please like, comment, and subscribe. Tell me if you like the Eisenhorn. Um, I'm going to get back to Legion next week. Um, but if you like this, I might read a little bit more from it when the book comes into my possession. I loaned it out to my fiancé because he, he likes Warhammer, the tabletop game, but he was never into the literature universe. So I introduced him to it. I was like, well, this is the book that got me into it. You read it. <laughs> so, but it's okay. He has traded books with me as well. And I've got some of his uh, Fuels Wars going to be another series that I'll eventually start on the channel. So find your nerd excuse me, that you can trade nerdy stuff with. So that's it for today. Wow, we're at 45 minutes. Homegirl can talk and read. So I will see all of you in the next one. Tell me what you think of Eisenhorn, please.